Good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, and good evening to our and welcome to our uh, friends and colleagues who are joining online for this evening on the great celebration of uh, an occasion of Mariana Lopez's uh, inaugural lecture. My name is Damien Murphy. I'm a professor of sound and music computing in the School of Physics, Engineering and Technology, and um, I've been asked to introduce Mariana this evening. So I've got an opportunity to say a few words. <laughs> Um, and it, first of all, it's a delight and an honour, both personally and professionally, uh, to introduce Professor Lopez this evening um, on the occasion of her inaugural lecture, which officially is some kind of mark of the beginning of her career as a professor here at the University of York. But uh, I've known Mariana for quite some time. So Mariana completed her... I first met Mariana when she arrived at York to do her MA in post-production in 2007. Uh, one of the first students registered in the department of what was then theatre, film and television, as it was then, uh, which I was helping out with in, in the earliest days. And Mariana completed her MA with us uh, and I clearly found success and a home here at York uh, as she applied for and was accepted to do PhD back here at York in the department of theatre, film and television. So Mariana returned in 2009 to begin her studies with us. And over this time developed a strong and enviable reputation in multidisciplinary research, exploring the sound, history, storytelling and performance of York medieval mystery plays. It was innovative and exciting work. And I was very happy when invited to act as external exam internal examiner for her thesis. I was perhaps a little less happy when I realized that one chapter ran to hundred pages of data and analysis. Something I've not quite let Mariana forget about, but it was still one of the shortest PhD Viva examinations that I've done, uh, which is testimony to the quality as much as the quantity of the work. After her PhD, Mariana spent some time at Anglia Ruskin University as a senior research fellow, building her profile and reputation in the field. But the draw of York was strong, and Mariana once again returned to us on this occasion to apply for a lectureship in the Department of Theatre Film and Television again. And this time I happen to be on the interview panel for the role. And this occasion remains very, very clear in my mind as it was one of the most assured, confident and compelling performances that interview I've ever seen. Mariana aced it, obviously. The University of York was lucky to attract Mariana back and we are lucky to have her still. And as of 2016, set herself on a career trajectory that brings us to this particular and auspicious occasion. Mariana's academic career at York has included the clear passion and commitment to her teaching and her students, recognised both through nominations and awards in the annual USU Excellence Awards and numerous invitations to speak to external audiences, including our ever popular York Talks. And Mariana has continued with her ethos of collaborative working and partnership in her research, which has led to considerable success in, in securing external funding including the Arts and Humanities Research Council supported Enhancing Audio Description and the aptly and efficiently titled Enhancing Audio Description 2 <laughs> project. <laughs> the latter of which was to the tune of one million pounds in value, a particular marker of success in the Arts and Humanities Research community where such grants tend not to be so large. We will learn more about these projects and what follows, I hope. Underpinning all of this sustained success has been Mariana's strong and moral sense of social justice and commitment to equality, diversity, inclusion in her research, her practice, her teaching and professional life. And this has been despite or maybe because of the sometimes significant factors and challenges she has faced in living up to this commitment. It is therefore particularly fitting, particularly fitting that this work and its presence throughout all aspects of her research provides the focus and underlying theme of Mariana's inaugural lecture tonight. There will be opportunities to ask questions at the end uh, after the presentation. And if you are online, please use the Q&A or the chat functions. And I'll be keeping an eye on that through when we get to that point and uh, to make sure that your questions are represented or heard. But for now, Professor Lopez, over to you. <laughs> And start a timer because if I can write 200 words, 200 pages of a chapter, imagine how much I can speak. <laughs> um, 
Thank you so much. It's so lovely to see so many of uh, you today, both in person and online. It means a lot to me that you're here. Um, I'd like to start with some thank yous. And, and firstly, I'd like to thank Damien uh, for, for a lovely presentation, but also um, Damien has been supporting me for uh, over a decade. Um, and uh, I, I do truly mean it when I say that I wouldn't be standing here giving the lecture if it wasn't for this wonderful man who has supported me throughout my career, but also encouraged me to apply for the promotion to professor, even though there was no end of people telling me I was never going to get it. But Damien showed um, unfaltering belief in myself and my skills as a researcher, uh, an educator and a practitioner. So thank, thanks to you. But also I would like to take an opportunity to thank all the wonderful women in academia that when I reached out and asked about their experiences as women applying uh, for a promotion to professor, they uh, gave a wealth of advice. They didn't just give advice, they read drafts of the application, they provided feedback. And very importantly to me, they shared their stories of their challenges. And that is really, uh, together with Damien's support, that really propelled me to apply for this promotion. What I'm going to be doing today is telling you about my research, of course, and my practice, but I'd also like to tell you about myself as a person and my identity, because that has shaped everything I've chosen to do. I am a woman in academia, but uh, very importantly, I'm a Latina in academia, Woo! and I'm an immigrant as well. We see we have representation here. Uh, and uh, and I'm, a, I'm an immigrant as I'm uh, from Argentina. And uh, all these characteristics, this identity has shaped how I see the academic sector, how I see the audio and acoustic engineering sector, um, and how I interact within those spaces and how I do my work. Today, I'm going to be sharing a number of stories, anecdotes, reflections, and some of them are not always or never going to be particularly positive. There might be negative behavior that I allude to. And I do ask you that if for some reason you see yourself represented in that negative behavior, that you please don't take it personally. I am here to raise awareness. I'm using this position to raise awareness of what it means to be a, a person with all of these identities in the academic community, but also the audio sound design engineering community. I'd also like to say that I can only speak from my own experiences and uh, those are different from everyone that belongs to different minority groups and different intersections. And I'm also very, very aware of my own privileges, which are many. And uh, I know uh, and, and completely acknowledge that a lot of people face uh, larger and have faced and will continue to face sadly uh, more challenges than I do. But I do hope you find these reflections useful. So I'd like to start with an image. And I'm going to lower the light so that you can see this wonderful image a bit better. So does anybody recognize these two women on screen and the occasion for these two women on screen? Oh, who are they? <laughs> Jayla and Shakira. And do you know what this is? It's a Super Bowl. And these are my Zumba participants. <laughs> exactly. So on the left, we have Shakira. And on the right, we have J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez, just in case you're not in the know. And, and this is the halftime Super Bowl performance in February 2020. Quite an important month and year as well. Um, this was a very, very important moment for very many reasons. It was the first time that two Latinas co-headed the Super Bowl performance. But it was also uh, an occasion in which two of the oldest women ever headed the Super Bowl performance. And I'd be curious to know, Shakira was uh, 43 at the time and J-Lo was 50. And we all know that after 40, we should all hide in a cupboard and never show our bodies or faces again. <laughs> so the fact that they were allowed to perform in an international stage is, all, is very meaningful as well. The performance was hailed as a success. Wonderful dancing skills, wonderful uh, singing, 
wonderful performance, and it was hailed as a celebration of Latin heritage. Now, of course, there's always people criticizing things, and some people thought it was too sexy. Some people even say it was soft porn. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, now, I didn't even think someone could just be too sexy, and that that <laughs> I just thought you, you know, sexy or not. And also, I didn't know that could be a bad thing either. So there you go. So we can probably ignore all that and focus on the positive. This performance is actually really meaningful to me. I have watched it a few times. I absolutely love it. And I wouldn't be able to put in words to you why it means too much, so much to me. Probably because we have two superpower powers of the music industry, two Latinas together performing on stage in an international stage. And to me, for example, Shakira means a lot. I grew up with her music when I was a teacher. She's very, very uh, iconic in Argentinian uh, music. Um, she's very much loved. And I grew up as a teenager with her music. I, you know, the typical singing along in your bedroom, everybody does it. <laughs> um, and um, my parents will remember, fondly or not, many car journeys with the same album in repeat. So I have memories, they have memories. <laughs> so uh, very, very important to me growing up and still important to me. Representation, they say it matters. They say it matters as seeing ourselves and other people that look and have a similar identity to our own. And these two women, they matter to me. When I announced my promotion on social media, I uh, received many, many beautiful messages. Thank you very much. There was one that stood out to me because it was a, a personal message, a private message from someone I actually don't know. And I, of course, anonymized the text so that they wouldn't be made recognizable. They sent me the following. They said, congratulations on becoming probably the first, maybe the only woman of color professor of sound. I just want to say how happy I am to see people like you succeed in a very non-diverse role and in sound. I don't know if this is true, this statement. I actually don't know. I do know. I don't know other Latinas in sound or other fields uh, as professors in the UK and at an international level outside of Latin America. It's true that I actually don't know any. So this might be true or not. We can also stand here and discuss the definition of women of color uh, for quite a long time, but we won't be doing that today. But what matters to me about the statement is what it meant for the person that wrote it. It's not about me, really. It's about what it represented to this person. Because representation does matter. I chose to do this inaugural lecture because I believe representation does matter. And I know that me being in this position that is a privilege, it's an influential position, does matter to a lot of people that might feel themselves see themselves reflected uh, in, in, in myself. A few months ago, I came across some research by Keisha Thomas, Emeritus Professor of Industrial and Organization Psychology and African American Studies at University of Georgia. Keisha Thomas has been doing some very interesting research on what she calls from pet to threat. And she has been studying the experiences of women of color in general, but more specific, black women in academia and beyond, and how they're treated by the organizations in which they work. What does it mean, pet and threat, in uh, Keisha Thomas's work? Pet would be a, a woman that enters an organization and is the typical token for diversity. It's the person that you might recognize this, does all the outreach workshops, goes to every school, does every diversity and equality uh, workshop. Uh, appears in every promotional video because the truth is there's no one else to appear in the promotional video. And they need to look, organizations need to look like they're doing a good job. Of course, they're not, but it doesn't matter. It looks good. So they appear in every video. They are not seen as influential. And as a result, they are nurtured. They are supported. But what happens if they become influential, if they can have a say? Keisha Thomas tells us that's when they turn into threats. So threats are women in these organizations that do have influence. They're minorities that have been able to advance through their career successfully. 
And then what happens is they start being seen as suspicious. They're ostracized because how could they be so successful? Surely the system is rigged against them. So they're ostracized, marginalized further. They're a reminder to institutions that leadership can be different to what we're told it has to be. They show that there's a different potential to a different career path that can be equally successful. They destabilize the organization by showing that. Then they're suspicious, they're threats, and generally her work shows that support is often withdrawn, mentorship is withdrawn as a result. And there's a very interesting phrase that I thought was appropriate for today that I took a quote that I took from uh, her work that says, one new full professor expressed disappointment when an associate professor colleague commented, how did you get promoted again so quickly? Rather than congratulating her on reaching this milestone. This phrase sounds so familiar, to, so familiar to me. I have heard this phrase said to me in different occasions, but uh, all the women that have very kindly shared their stories have actually said, without knowing necessarily about this research, have said very, very similar ways. Too successful, too suspicious. Tisha C. Thomas's work has also been used in areas wider than academia. And I came across an article recently about Beyonce. And this article uh, reflected on some of the things that anonymously Browning voters had said about her. They said they weren't voting for her because she was too successful. She had won too much. She was too good. Surely she can't continue winning. We can't continue voting for her because she makes everybody look bad. Imagine that, not awarding something to someone talented just because she's too good. And surely that cannot be possible. So have a think about how women in your organizations and your fields are treated. Pets, threats, a transition from one to the other. Some of you might be familiar with the um, phrase or saying, especially if you work in diversity and equality, uh, that you're making too much change too fast. <laughs> <laughs> you have you have to slow down because people cannot catch up with this this amount of equality that you're trying to to put into this organization or the other one good practice will sort it out i'm really sorry but good practice isn't going to sort anything out we're not going to get equality and diversity by just sitting down and wishing it would get better we're only going to reach it if we actually do something about it and we care enough to do something about it and believe me not everybody actually cares Enough. It is quite interesting, but unsurprising that many times those phrases of you're doing too much too fast come from people that actually are not being um, affected by things being too slow, change being too slow. As some of you may know, I uh, worked um, in uh, leading gender equality campaigns, both nationally and internationally for a certain audio organization, which I'm not going to name today. Um, it was an eye-opening experience of what happens when you do try to make really influential change rather than talking about making changes. I learned that everybody says they're allies, but they really aren't. And I know this sounds a bit depressing, but I think I can count, if I'm lucky, I can count maybe five, seven people there are true allies that they will step up and do what is right. And they will recognize something that is wrong, no matter whether they like the person that it's being done to or not, whether there's a friend or not, but they will stand up for what is right. Everybody's an ally. The media tells us everybody's an ally of minority groups. Social media, everybody's great apparently, but how many actually would stand up for those when they need support, not many. So think about it, are you a good ally? When I have questionable behavior thrown in my direction, I see it in this way. I have two choices. One, decide and reflect that I'm actually quite tired of educating people in that way. I decide just not to do anything, just to let it go and go on with my day, which I find quite difficult. Um, another thing 
I may decide to do is to actually say something. I don't know others, but when I decide to say something, it's probably because I think there is a chance. And I have, because of many circumstances of, on my work campaigning for equality, I sometimes even have women sending me emails saying, look, this has happened from the outside. What do you think? When someone actually raises something and asks you to reflect, it's a compliment. They think you can be better. They think the organization can be better. You should worry when they stop raising things. That's a moment to worry. But sadly, when I raise things, I often encounter a phrase that is a variation of, you made me feel bad. You made me feel guilty. I'm now upset. You should feel upset. <laughs> you really should feel upset if someone is telling you you did something that you shouldn't have. It's okay to feel upset. I have had I, I have had things told, and it's okay. Someone tells me I can I can try to be better. This is what the conversation is about. Sadly, when people respond in that way, they're treating you as a threat. You're the suspicious person that came and told them what you were doing wrong, what they were doing wrong. And they're trying to send you to a corner. That's how I feel. They're trying to send me to a corner, ostracize me further. And they're telling me, you know what? I don't actually want you to think about equality and diversity and telling me how to be better. I want you just, just for it to look nice in the brochure. So if you do do that, think about why you're doing it. Because generally when someone raises something, they just want to be listened. They just want to be acknowledged. They just want to work with you to make things better for everyone. If you attend a talk like this and um, you go at the end and tell someone, I didn't hear a word or pay attention to anything you said, because I could just not stop thinking about where you were from and where your accent was from. That's not a compliment. <laughs> I know, I know it's, you, may, you may think it is, but really it isn't. I have been in so many occasions when people have told me this. I have been surrounded maybe by native speakers, British colleagues, other researchers, and they get congratulated for their research. I am asked about my accent. It's quite depressing. And I have talked with other uh, uh, academics who are immigrants and they have shared similar experiences. It's not fun. And don't do it at the end of here as a joke, so I probably won't find it. <laughs> Just if you're thinking to try to wind me up. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because it has shaped, those experiences have shaped who I am, has shaped how I think about academia, how I think about the audio field, about sound sound field, etc. It has shaped the research I do, but it has also shaped my interactions within those areas, how I feel about people when they approach me, how I, what I think they're thinking about me, etc. It shapes everything. It's impossible for them not to. I used to think that you could separate yourself from your research. We are told so many times in academia, write in the third person, make sure you're as distant to your, your subject of study as possible so that you can be objective. I just don't think that's true. I don't think we can do that. Everything we do in research and our jobs is to do with who we are. And I'd like to thank um, my friend and colleague, Dan Walser, for helping me see this. Dan and I edited uh, a book collection on audio education together, which is available for purchase if you want online or in your local bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Dan uh, edited my book chapter when we were working together. And uh, I wrote on gamification in the audio, um, in audio engineering in uh, um, universities. And Dan, when he read my chapter, he said, look, everything's it's all right, everything's good, but I don't get a sense of who you are when you write. I just don't know. Why are you interested in this? Why don't you add a little bit more about this? And I was a bit like, oh, that means I need to make changes. No. <laughs> uh, but he was absolutely right, because the reality is I choose those pedagogical techniques because I worked for many years as a teacher of English as a foreign language with, um, with my parents. And that has shaped how I think about interaction in the classroom. So it's absolutely relevant. So thank you so much, Dan, if you're listening for all your support. Another thing that uh, I, um, there's a piece of advice you see that I uh, always give new researchers. Do you want to hear what it is? Yes. 
Yes, I'm going to tell you anyway. So, you know, I hope you want to you want to listen. Is you should research what makes you angry. I'm obviously angry about a few things, so this helps me. <laughs> now, and and there's there's so much to be angry about, isn't it? It's great because it's going to fuel all your academic career. So you have loads ahead of you. But besides researching what makes me angry, I also um, realized not that long ago that um, my research all has in common uh, an aspect of uh, social justice in it. Either when I research accessibility and audio techniques and design, that is about social justice, but also when I research the past and past societies and their representation and their sounds, that also is about social justice. So I'm going, what I'm going to be telling you about now is about those projects. So I'll start telling you a little bit about my work on accessibility. Um, in terms of accessibility, I work on uh, alternatives to audio description for film, uh, for visually impaired film and television audiences. And uh, what I have done that uh, Damien has already alluded to is work on what I have unoriginally called Enhancing Audio Description 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good with titles. Okay. Uh, and we have worked on the development of enhanced audio description methods. And this work has been funded uh, in two different projects by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful work that my colleagues do. Uh, so co-investigator Professor uh, Gavin uh, Kearney, but also um, postdoctoral researchers, Dr. Christian Hofstadter and Dr. Michael McLaughlin, and our, wonder, our wonderful project officer, uh, Shaima Aluan. So if we're researching alternatives to audio description, it means there's something called audio description. And what I'll do is I'll play a clip and I'm gonna have to dim the lights because the clip is really dark. Um, and um, I'll play a clip that was from a film that was produced here in the department as part of a third year module on film and TV group uh, projects. And that was 2014, I think the director was Hannah Palumbo and the film is called Pearl. In the room, Oliver continues his medical examination and listens to Margaret's back with his stethoscope. He frowns and looks at Margaret in alarm. Oliver takes the stethoscope off and stands up. Cecily watches again. I'm going to get better, aren't I? You're a tough girl, Margaret. I think you'll be fine. Excuse me. Margaret stops Oliver and holds out her hand with a polished white pearl in her palm. Cecily comes in. When did you take this? It's all right. These are not to give away. A word, Miss Grimshaw. Now, please. Margaret watches as Cecily turns and walks out of the room with the pearl, followed by Oliver. The two of them stand by a fire in the gloomy hallway. I'll just take you through what's going to happen. You're going to go upstairs and pack Margaret a bag while I call an ambulance. I think not. Margaret doesn't want that, and I'm not going to force her. Um, so that is a typical example of audio description uh, for uh, a film production. And um, why are we researching alternatives to audio description? So audio description is very important, essential to many visually impaired people accessing film and television. But one of the challenges of audio description is that it is a process like most accessibility work that is completely separate from the creative and technical process of making a film and television production. So something is completed and sent to an audio describer or an audio description company to create this accessibility layer. And what may happen is that the audio description doesn't always perfectly match the original production, for example, in tone, or uh, genre, et cetera. And there might even be cases in which the focus that the audio description took is maybe not necessarily the focus that the uh, filmmaking uh, team or television making team would have taken. Another important aspect that drives uh, the work on enhanced audio description is actually problems of diversity. To me, accessibility should all 
be about diversity. It's about acknowledging different ways of experiencing audiovisual material. But it really isn't because if you're a visually impaired person and wants to, and you want to access film or television, you have two options. You switch it on or you switch it off. And that's if it's even available. So UK broadcasting has about 20% of programming with audio uh, description. And I have learned through my wonderful uh, doctoral researchers that uh, in other countries, there's even less than that. So it's much more challenging. But there is no, no consideration on different preferences. And different preferences are not necessarily linked to a type of um, visual impairment. It might have to do with just aesthetic preferences in general. So what we aim to do in uh, our work is to personalize accessibility, to give end users a choice of how they can access material. At a very basic level, this might be having an option between audio description and our EAD methods. And at uh, a more granular level is having options within those uh, layers of access. Another thing we do is embrace creativity. There's a lot of discussion within audio description scholarship about objectivity and subjectivity. But you really cannot be objective in audio description. You are constantly choosing in very limited gaps what to describe and how that is described. So it is a subjective practice. And we completely embrace this and we turn it into something creative. And we do that by harnessing the power of sound design to provide engagement and accessibility. We go beyond uh, kind of using the voice, the, the words to provide access. And instead we look at how other sound elements can provide accessibility as well. The general aim is to reduce verbal descriptions and focus on sound design as an accessibility method. So how do we actually do this in practice? We combine three main methods, sound effects, binaural audio, and iVoice, which combined are what we call the EAD methods. So let's just go through each of them to explain a little bit more what that means. So to discuss sound effects, if we go back to that example of that film, Pearl, uh, that towards the end of that film, uh, sorry for the spoiler, <laughs> um, there is a beautiful sequence in which Margaret, the main character, runs very dramatically along the beach towards the shore. And she's followed by her uh, mother and the doctor. Uh, in the original film, uh, the students uh, decided to um, focus mostly on how cinematography and the musical score could provide uh, engagement with the scene. And it works very well in the original production. And surprisingly, when we tested this with visually impaired people, nobody could really follow what was happening because you could only hear the musical score. And musical scores on their own don't generally tell us what's happening. And there might be conflicting opinions on what emotional, uh, what emotionally is happening as well. So we did something that is actually very, very simple. We brought back all the sound effects that had been removed. So in our version, we can hear the characters. We can hear Margaret running along the beach. We can hear her footsteps. More importantly, we can hear her, uh, her breathing. Breathing is very important because A, when we don't see an image, we can, it establishes presence. It tells us someone is there, but it also tells us the motion of that uh, character depending on how they're breathing. In addition to that, we can hear the ambulances. We can hear the waves, we can hear the wind, we can hear the seagulls. So it tells us where they are. Additionally, this particular, this particular scene had a moment in which um, we can see uh, Margaret's mother mouthing the words, Margaret, 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 but we couldn't hear them. So we just contacted the actress and, uh, and asked her, can you just stand on top of a hill and just say, Margaret, Margaret, Margaret. She couldn't come to the studio. We don't just make everybody stand in. Um, so she recorded those lines and we added it to the production. And when we tested this, we went from having a completely inaccessible scene to having a completely accessible scene with very, very simple changes. EAD is all about simplicity. So that's the sound effects. What about binaural audio? So binaural audio in very simple uh, words is 3D audio through headphones. So it's wearing headphones, 
and listening to audio that you you don't just hear a left and a right you hear a front and a back and you hear a height component and everything around it uh, our work has been focusing mostly on binaural audio and headphone reproduction although we're now also focusing on loudspeaker threads why is this important to uh, accessibility because if we can play sounds from uh, where they are on screen, then we don't have to describe where they are. So we can break away from the dialogue being in film and television, always from the center speaker, and make the dialogue follow the movement of the characters. So you will see where a character is going from and to, but also if you do the same with sounding objects, you don't need to describe them. So for example, you might hear um, a fire uh, crackling on the, at, at your back on the right, someone opening the door at the back towards your left, and someone pouring a drink in front of you. So it creates a picture sonically. The third method that we use is what we call iVoice. Uh, it's a fancy term from sound theorist Michel Chion, and in the use that we give it, it's a first person description or narration. And this is when there are elements in the production we're working on that we feel cannot be really conveyed through sound effects or spatialization. And we include a short description by the main character or characters to explain the information. And we do it very briefly and uh, we process it with reverberation. So with acoustics uh, information so that it can be differentiated from the rest of the dialogue and monologues and voiceover from the production. And those three uh, methods together are what we call the EAD methods, and they're designed to be incorporated to the film and television workflows from the start. So here, accessibility is no longer an add-on, it's integral to the production. It's as important as editing, as sound design, as directing, as performance. It's crucial. He listens with his stethoscope. He is shocked at what he hears. I'm going to get better, aren't I? You're a tough girl, Margaret. I think you'll be fine. Excuse me. I don't want him to leave. So, I offer him a pearl. When did you take this? It's all right. These are not to give away. A word, Miss Grimshaw. Now, please. I'll just take you through what's going to happen. You're going to go upstairs and pack Margaret a bag while I call an ambulance. I think not. Margaret doesn't want that, and I'm not going to force her. So now I would like to tell you a little bit about my other main uh, field of research that is acoustical heritage and historical soundscapes. Uh, the images are a bit dark, so you might not um, necessarily see them very clearly. But on the left, uh, that is an image of Dalkerbottom Cave in the Yorkshire Dales. And it, this is from uh, the project Acoustic Atlas by the amazing Dr. Kobe Van Tonder. Uh, please do check out her work and um, you can do kind of real time uh, hearing yourself in different spaces. So please do visit her website. And on the right is a photo from um, the Project Cathedral Acoustics led by another wonderful uh, researcher, Dr. Lydia Alvarez Morales. And both projects were funded by the Euro European Commission under the Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellowship. So what does acoustical heritage and historical soundscapes mean? It is the study of past cultures through the consideration of their sonic experiences. This could be considering individual sounds and their importance, but also combinations of sounds into soundscapes, but also environments. So how the acoustics of environments affects the emission of sound, but also the perception of sounds. Um, and this can be done in very many different ways. From an acoustical engineering perspective, what we tend to do is acoustic measurements. 
And that is a picture from King's College Chapel in Cambridge from a while back. And in red and blue is me looking incredibly stressed. And uh, that green uh, light over there, that's a loudspeaker space uh, placed on a pulpit area. So this is the choir area of King's College Chapel. And what we generally do for measurements is we play a signal that is a sine sweep. So uh, an audio signal that goes from really low frequencies to really high frequencies. And we record it back through microphones. In this case, at the back, there's a sound from mic, but in very, very general terms, it's like a 3D audio mic. And at the front, uh, the much cuter dummy head, which has microphones in its ears and replicates uh, kind of human hearing. So what we do is we play the signal in the space that we're interested in studying, and we record how it sounds in that space. And the uh, position of the source and the, and the microphones hopefully has a connection to the use of that space. And we, will make, we would make loads of different combinations to study the space in different ways. What we do after we, did, we do the recordings is what we call a deconvolution process. We separate the original signal that we played and that we know what it is from the uh, reaction of the space to that signal. And what we end up is with a very underwhelming sound that sounds a little bit like a hand clap. But the really interesting thing about that is that you can derive a lot of objective data, so numerical data. And that can tell you a lot about the space. It can tell you how uh, intelligible speech is in certain positions. It can tell you how defined or not musical notes are. It can tell you how wide a sound source appears and maybe how enveloping the sound experience might be, as well as how fast sound uh, decays or not in that space. Another thing that might happen, another scenario, is that the space that you want to study is not a space, if we're talking about historical spaces, heritage sites, may no longer exist or may it may not be in existence in the uh, format structure that you wish to study. And in those cases, we work with virtual modules. And this is another photo from Lydia's work on cathedral acoustics. This is the Lady uh, Chapel of Ely Cathedral. And uh, Lydia, in this case, uh, was interested in studying the acoustics of the space in the past. So here you have the acoustic models. And on the far right, this is the space as it was when we took the measurements in 2019. This helps us validate that the computer module is working as close to reality as possible. In the middle, you have the space in 1930. So the model is modified to match the historical records. And on the far left is the space in the 14th century based on the evidence that exists about it. And for each of these models, we can derive more of those impulse responses, those little hand clapping like sounds that tell us about the space and how the acoustics change throughout history. But thankfully, not everything is about numbers. You can also hear the space. And what you can do is do recordings that are hopefully are relevant to the space you're studying, and then combine them through a process called convolution and hearing, hear how that audio might have sound in those spaces. And this is another amazing uh, researcher and artist. This is Dr. Uh, Pierre-Philippe Deschamps, uh, who uh, we have a habit of just chucking inside an anechoic chamber and getting to sing. Uh, and he's been doing this for years. Um, and this is an anechoic chamber, so it's a space with no acoustic reflections. And this is a recording that Lydia has very uh, kindly sent to me. And you will be able to hear uh, First, Pierre's voice as it sounds in that anechoic chamber, but then combined with uh, the uh, results of uh, the Cathedral Acoustics Project. Gloria in excessis Deo, et in terra pax hominibus, bone the difference there is quite clear. Um, and this has uh, th this process that is what we call a realization is hearing the spaces 
has a lot of potential to sharing work on historical heritage with non-specialist audiences. Now, of course, acoustic engineering is not the only or should not be the only way in which we approach the study of the sounds of the past. A lot of my work is actually based, um, as Damon highlighted at the start, by interdisciplinary studies. So I'm very interested in the field of sensory anthropology and sensory history, because this field very much tells us how the senses, including hearing, are not universal. We all hear differently across history, across cultures. So we need to be very, very careful when we listen to this sort of um, audio renditions and, and we make claims of taking it back to the past to how the ancestors listened to sound. It's not actually really true because when I hear, hear singing and I hear those, uh, that acoustical setting, what it means to me is not the same that, for example, it would have meant to people in, the, in medieval times in the York Minster. It doesn't matter that I'm able to recreate the acoustics, it's just not the same experience. And even within the same uh, society, culture, uh, people's characteristics, uh, experiences, cultural experiences will influence the senses and how uh, senses have hierarchies within them. So we can recreate acoustical heritage and we can recreate soundscapes. We just need to be a little bit careful with the claims we make. And this is something that I explored in a project called The Soundscapes of the York Mystery Plays. So my PhD, including the very long chapter, was about the York Mystery Plays. Uh, and uh, for those not familiar with them, they are a series of about 40 plays, medieval plays that were performed from the 14th to the 16th century in the streets of York. They had a religious theme and the plays started with a creation and ended with a last judgment. And they were performed on wagons that were specifically constructed for the occasion. And they were pushed around the, cities, the city of York, following a predetermined route and stopping in specific spaces to perform for an audience. And um, some of you may be familiar with the tradition of actually taking the wagons back to the streets here in York every four years in a more condensed format. The York Mystery Plays are a great um, case study for acoustical heritage research because we actually don't know that much about their performance. There's no surviving uh, pictorial evidence. There's no wagon that has been unearthed. And um, all we have is the text of the place, other similar performances in continental Europe, and some uh, kind of manuscripts that remain. But we do require some, some imagination and putting back together to see what they might have, uh, how they might have been performed. So um, what the Soundscapes of the York Mystery Plays looked to do was to provide uh, the, the visitor of this interactive website with an opportunity to play with the sounds and the acoustics of the Mystery Plays. So you can listen to the performance audio and then change the acoustical settings, all based on possible settings for the plays. And you can also add different sound elements. And these are some of the sound elements that you can add. It was a very good day in the office. <laughs> um, and I, I'd like to acknowledge the cooperation of Basil, the pig here. Um, and I, I don't want to disappoint you, but he's not a medieval pig. He's just a pig. Uh, and I always like to say that one can only work with the pigs you have available. <laughs> and this is what I had available. But all the sounds are based on research on what sounds might have been present during different performances. But the interface also had two main aims. <laughs> One is to avoid this crystallization of um, acoustical heritage and historical sound soundscapes experiences. This idea that there is one version of the sounds of the past that we're presenting to audiences, when the reality is that there's a lot of things that we don't know. So I wanted to open up that to people to explore and make their own decisions as to what they thought might, the performance might have been, uh, been like. But there's another very important uh, aim that has to do with representation and to me with, with social justice and diversity is that there is a huge gap in research of medieval drama acoustics. When you go through uh, research on theater acoustics historically, you will find that books jump from Greek and Roman to Elizabethan theater. There's quite a few centuries in the middle. 
And uh, a lot of that is likely a result of preconceptions on medieval theatre. That idea that surely a temporary structure couldn't have been sophisticated enough. But that's not actually true. They were very highly sophisticated performances with very highly sophisticated uh, music pieces as well. And another important thing is that a lot of Episcopal heritage work focuses on what I call spaces of power. So generally quite grandiose spaces. Most of the time European and most of the time linked to Christianity. And there's very little exploration of open spaces that would have been available to more people more widely. But this project was also about defying that and providing a different uh, idea of acoustical heritage and what it could be. So I made a little video uh, rather than trying to test this life. <laughs> um, and the video will take you from how the interface goes from um, a virtual rendition of an illuminated page that invites the user to go to watch the mystery place in Stonegate, which is where the acoustic measurements and the computer models were done. And um, it then will take you to the interactive experience. And I'd like to acknowledge the work of Dr. Marcus Harding and Austin One on this project as we collaborated in the creation of the interface. So I'm going to dim the light so you can actually see. So clicking on the manicure uh, takes you to a medieval uh, map of York and the little wagon there is exactly where the wagon was placed in the virtual models. So a lot of my work in this field is really um, underpinned by this interest in how do researchers in this field decide what is worthy of study and why are some other spaces like street spaces largely ignored and what that, that means for heritage studies and for diversity of heritage studies. But also whose spaces are they? Whose acoustical heritage is it? And what happens when with, with researchers, when researchers from, for example, European universities, acoustic teams, goes, go to communities that are not their own and do that research and extract that acoustical heritage, so to speak. Whose research is it? How are they involving that communi those communities? And if they're not, what are the ethical challenges of doing that? And very much a feeling that the way forward for that field to me is one of interdisciplinarity. Acoustical heritage, acoustic engineering work, focusing on acoustical heritage tends to have problems of lack of considerations of cultural aspects. Whereas arts and humanities only focus um, projects tend to also sometimes not make the, the most of technological advancements and how they can aid research. <laughs> this brings me to um, my uh, work on sonic medievalisms in games. That image is a little bit difficult to see, but that's The Witcher 3, The Wild Hunt. And uh, this is the exploration of how games represent the Middle Ages sonically. What are they telling us about what, the, what they believe the Middle Ages are? And this to me is important in two main, two main reasons. Once uh, one is that the soundscapes of the York Mystery Place did look a lot into gaming techniques 
to explore how we could better um, provide experiences of acoustical heritage to non-specialist audiences and how to engage them better. But also I am interested in what version of the sounds of the Middle Ages is put forward to, uh, to gamers, because when we were doing the research on the interface and we were asking for feedback, it was quite evident that some preconceptions on the sounds of the Middle Ages were not based on what was in the interface, but it was also not based on anything historical. So it is very likely that it has to do with preconceptions and medievalisms. So what I have been doing is mostly I, I play games mm -hmm. and I call it work. <laughs> um, and um, I'll, I'll dim that so that you can see the image in case it's of interest. Uh, but some of the things I've been looking at is the use of voices in games. And this brings me back to questions of accents. A lot of these games uh, miss the opportunity of using multilingual design. And using multilingual design will open up opportunities to raise awareness of how diverse the Middle Ages were and the fact that you would have heard in certain cities, in certain areas, different languages. But by not doing that, they often resort to accented English to indicate, let's call it foreignness. This is slightly, this is very controversial, really. I want to say slightly, but it is very controversial because it generally resorts to stereotypes on how people imagine others to speak and it reinforces those stereotypes. Another thing that I look at in this games is aspects of environments. So natural versus um, urban. So generally what we find is that natural environments are represented in a very idyllic way, very quiet areas, lots of bird song and wind. Uh, and it comes from notions, invented notions of the pastoral. Uh, but that generally is constructed Con contrasted with urban spaces which are dirty and full of plague. So you uh, hear a lot of coughing and very clear signs of disease. Sorry, <laughs> um, I, I didn't design the games. Um, and another very important thing is that they're generally based on conflict. They represent a Middle Ages that is mainly just violent. Uh, loads of fights, loads of bloodshed. And that's generally what propels many of these games forward. And that in itself is a misrepresentation. Um, what I love ab about um, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is that it actually has loads of beautiful moments in which it depicts uh, cultural moments linked to sound. So full musical performances, but also um, there is a part of the game in which to progress, you have to stage a medieval um, drama uh, play, which I love, Chris loved that bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, that kind of starts a move in the right direction of it's not just about the battles, but there's more to the Middle Ages than that. And I have also been looking into aspects of religion, spirituality and magic that are often very, very intertwined. Uh, generally, you get uh, this twinkly sounds to represent uh, magic, but also religion. And um, interestingly enough, renditions of acoustical settings, reverberation, are very, very often used to indicate religious, magical, spiritual experiences. But what are these games telling us about the Middle Ages? How diverse, non-diverse are? The Middle Ages were diverse, but they're not being represented as such. And this is important to me because the feeling of historical empathy is important. If we're not able to empathize with people from the past, it's very likely that we cannot empathize with people in the present that are different to us. So this is very, very important for that social justice component. I hope I have managed to take you very quickly through uh, different projects that might seem very different uh, from the outside, but to me are closely connected by this interest, interest in diversity, representation, equality, and social justice. And I'd like to finish with, um, with a poem from um, a an Uruguayan poet uh, called Juana de Ibarburu. Um, and I'd like to thank my mom that, uh, that recommended um, this, uh, this particular poet for today. And I also realized that at the start, I thanked everyone ex except my family. <laughs> and my partner. <laughs> I just, so I had to, while you were watching, I wrote 
planning partner here. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much uh, to them for uh, for listening uh, to me throughout uh, the process of the application. Uh, I'm sure they were happy when I finally got it because then I could stop talking about it. <laughs> um, but uh, going back to Juana de Barburu, um, I'd like to um, read uh, a poem to you that when I read it, it felt to me like it encompassed the importance and the beauty of diversity. So it's called The Thick Tree. For it is harsh and ugly, for all its branches are gray. I pity the fig tree. On my manor, there are a hundred beautiful trees, round plum trees, straight lemon trees, orange trees with shiny blossoms. In springtime, they all are covered with flowers around the fig tree. Only the poor one seems forlorn with its twisted branches that are never dressed in buds. Therefore, every time I pass it, I say, trying to give a sweet and happy tone to my voice. It is the most beautiful fig tree among all the trees in the garden. If it listens, if it understands the language I am speaking, what a sweet grace will nestle in its sensitive soul of this tree. And maybe at night, when the wind is fanning its crown, drunk with joy, it may tell. Today, they told me I am beautiful. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.